Uh, thank you very much for coming here this afternoon uh, for this program. Uh, I'm Princeton Lyman, a senior advisor here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and we're looking forward to really uh, a, an extraordinary discussion um, about, as you see on the program, one-time miracle or exemplar, what are the lessons of Mandela's legacy and South Africa's transition for other countries. All of us, uh, I think, who've had any connection with South Africa, we're very pleased at the tremendous international attention at the time of the passing of Nelson Mandela to not only him personally, but to uh, what he stood for, the legacy he created, and that South Africa still lives by today. But in all that wonderful discussion and tribute, I think there was a feeling that the relevance of South Africa to the rest of the world needs even for much further work, much further discussion, much more intensive effort. And we're very fortunate today uh, to have with us visiting uh, some extraordinary people and, and, and others. And you have bios on them. I won't go into it at great length. But uh, many of you, I think, know Ambassador Rasul. Ambassador Rasul is a, a scholar, uh, a, a political figure, governor of the Western Cape, uh, a man of, of faith, uh, an extraordinarily active ambassador, uh, and a man who carries that understanding and legacy from South Africa to a number of other countries. Uh, next to him is uh, Mohammed Baba, who has played a major role in the development of the South African Constitution, wrote the chapter on local government, and those of you who remember that time remember that issues of, of state and local government were some of the most difficult issues in the Constitution, uh, played a major role in the negotiation, has been very active subsequently, as I'll talk about all of them. And then my very good friend, uh, Rolf Meyer. We spent many, many hours together uh, in South Africa, a man who was the principal negotiator for the government uh, of, of, uh, of F.W. de Klerk with the ANC and the others in those extraordinary negotiations. Uh, Rolf Meyer was not only a tremendous and wonderful negotiator, he was a man of great courage, and he uh, has been contributing, as Mohammed Baba and others, to bringing the relevant lessons from South Africa to countries in many parts of the world, uh, Northern Ireland, Sri Lanka, Bahrain, others that we will be talking about here. Um, we're going to, uh, I, I might say that I heard a, a much simpler view of the South African legacy from Mac Maharaj. When I was leaving South Africa, I said to uh, Mac, who was then a minister, I said, well, what, what's the future? How do you draw the lesson from this? He said, as long as we continue doing what we're doing, we'll be all right. And I said, well, what's that? He said, whenever we had a problem, we found a solution. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's not as simple as that, but uh, we will get into it. But first, uh, I want uh, to ask Tim Phillips, who is a co-founder of Beyond Conflict, a very important organization that's uh, sponsoring the visit of, uh, of uh, Mohammed Baba and Ralph Mayer. Tim, would you talk a little bit about Beyond Conflict and this visit and all good things? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Ambassador Lyman. It's my first opportunity today to meet the ambassador, and I had to thank him for uh, introducing me to Rolf Mayer uh, when he was ambassador to South Africa. We were doing this conference in Belfast in 1994, before the Good Friday peace process began. And who would have ever imagined in 1994 that just two or three years earlier that apartheid would have ended peacefully? And it struck us, uh, we the organizers, Wendy and others, that it would be important to bring the South Africans to Northern Ireland from both sides because of what they represented. And it was 
not easy in the beginning to reach out to Rolf Meyer or Sarah Ramaphosa. And we had support from uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Dublin, Jean Kennedy Smith and others, and they said, well, we'll reach out to my colleague and friend, Princeton Lyman. And so here was this very busy U.S. Ambassador who took my phone call. And I said, please, could you go to Minister Meyer and Minister Ramaphosa and ask them to come to this conference? And he did. And when I was in Belfast uh, three months later, the first person who responded was Rolf, and he was Minister of Constitutional Affairs. And I said, you know, this is long before email. And I said, I got this plain paper fax coming over the transom in which you agreed to attend. And I said, you know, other than the ambassador reaching out and asking you, why did you do it? Uh, you didn't know us. And he said, well, I called up Sarah Ramaphosa, and we both got the invitation. And he said, you know, nobody had ever asked us to come outside our country other than to get an honorary degree to talk about what we achieved. And to go to a place like Northern Ireland that's in the midst of a violent conflict was a moral responsibility. And so we both felt we had to come. And that visit in 1994 led to not only us doing over 20 initiatives in Northern Ireland, but Rolf and Cyril and many others playing a really active role both publicly and privately to help Northern Ireland think about peace. And I remember this moment at the conference when Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness came up to me and said, thank you. They said, you know, for us to hear Rolf and the other South Africans who have become friends talk about what they achieved lifts our conflict from being very provincial to being very important. And we, we take real sort of guidance and co confidence in their process. And so I'll just say that over the last 22 years now since Wendy and I co-founded this organization, it's been about sharing experience. It's been about taking people like Rolf and Mohammed and Ibrahim and sort of setting the table, pulling back as Americans and letting people like this or uh, Richard Goldstone, who I'm happy to see here. We both turned gray, so I didn't recognize you right away. <laughs> um, um, and who's on our advisory board. Um, but, you know, they share that experience. And uh, I'll just end by saying that people often say, well, how can people in South Africa have anything to connect to our experience? You know, everybody who's been through trauma, through repression, conflict, or dictatorship thinks their experience is unique, that nobody has suffered the way they have suffered. And when they hear people where compromise wasn't in their language, where they've actually reconciled in a real effective way and not something that seems very light, that that is deeply powerful. And that's been at the core of the South African experience that we've tried to bring around the world and what we're continue to work on, on today. So with that, I want to thank the USIP and others. And uh, oh, one final thing, Ina, our executive director, wanted to point out. We now have a book called Beyond Conflict, and if you go to Amazon, you can get it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. And, and I do want to point out that we are very privileged to have with us Richard and Nolene Goldstone. Uh, anybody who knows South Africa knows Judge Richard Goldstone, the fantastic contribution he made, and Nolene, uh, we're very, very happy to see you here, back in the U.S. again. It's wonderful. Uh, we're going to make this a conversation for a while, and then we're going to open it up. And, and let me ask, if I can, to the panel, when we talk about the, 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 the lessons of South Africa, the legacy of South Africa, what are we talking about that's most relevant for other countries? Is it that it was a negotiated transformation rather than a wholesale civil war? Is it reconciliation? Or is it because out of it came a very strong democracy? What are, what are the key lessons, or maybe all of them? Maybe, Rolf, if I could ask you to start on that and then others to come in. I can start off by saying Mac was right. <laughs> <laughs> I can recall that uh, during the process, Cyril and I developed this, this line between ourselves in, which said, there's not a problem that we can't resolve. And, uh, and I, I mean, that was serious. <laughs> you can imagine how powerful that was in itself. Now, I think um, I should start off by saying um, one of the most important lessons that, uh, that we can convey, just the three of us who are sitting here, is that uh, the process helped us to become friends from a position of complete animosity where we were literally enemies of each other mm -hmm. just over 20 years ago, <laughs> still. 
into a position where we not only share a platform like this, but we do it, first of all, as friends. And that's an amazing lesson in itself. And, and of course, Madiba had a lot to do with that. <laughs> the personality, the, the way in which he expressed himself, everything he did, everything he did since that day he walked out of, of prison, uh, helped us to overcome our <coughs> own shortcomings, our own misgivings, our own um, mistakes, but also our, uh, our, our own mistrust of each other. And there are three things that I would like to point out, you know, just for a start, to give a little bit of context, and we can dis discuss the detail more. Uh, that, that I keep on thinking, and I share this wherever we go. And Mohammed and I are traveling the world <laughs> as charity workers in conflict areas. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> there are three things that I share in every place that we go, and that is, I think the, 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 the fundamental characteristics or principles, if you want, that helped us to, to really settle our conflict in South Africa, to overcome our problems, were three things. The one was the fact that we, we did it on an inclusive basis. Now, inclusivity meaning in this context, not only the fact that we had at all given times more than 20 parties at the table negotiating, but the fact that we, that we helped each other to be part of the solution. Um, and it, it was sometimes difficult, and we had various mechanisms and whatever that helped us to do that. But I, I think the overarching principle in this regard was the one of inclusivity, bringing everybody together, not the one prescribing to the other, which is the natural tendency that you find in all conflicts, because the one side always thinks they are right and the other <laughs> side is wrong. And, and, and to overcome that and to realize that maybe I'm partly wrong and partly right and the other side is in the same position. That inclusive approach is, is the one thing. The other one is that we succeeded in building trust amongst each other. From a p position of complete mistrust, where we sort of hated each other. I never hated Muhammad, but I think he hated me. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but the point is, it was a, as a result of the long history of, of racial division in South Africa, more than 300 years, since the first white settlers arrived there. That obviously led to a long period of, of mistrust. How could you expect something different? And in this process, this relatively short process of just a few years, we succeeded in overcoming that and building trust between us. And Madiba was the key factor in, in helping us, to lead us to building that trust. And if, I, can, I can assure you, if we had, didn't have that level of trust between us, and I can speak from personal experience between Cyril and I, if we didn't have that trust, level of trust, the process would have taken much, much longer to complete, if at all. Uh, and the third one is the, the, the fact that we made it our own problem. <laughs> we didn't expect others to come and help us. Uh, we didn't have uh, the Secretary General involved, uh, or other multilateral institutions. Uh, we didn't have facilitators, and there were plenty of them that offered these services. <laughs> and, and, and most of them, uh, fortunately, the ANC, for different reasons than us at the time, said, no, sorry, we don't need your services. We trusted no one, and the ANC thought they could do it in any case themselves, so we didn't, <laughs> we didn't bring facilitators on board. But it was the right thing because it means that we have made, that we have taken ownership of this problem, but also ownership of what we had to do in terms of resolving it. Uh, so it was ownership and own responsibility. Let me stop there. Thank you. Well, when Ralph speaks of hundreds of years of, of, of uh, 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 an oppression system and a later apartheid system. And in other societies, you have these long-term grievances. The context in which you were working, how did, how did one move beyond that 
into having this kind of uh, relationship? Well, let me, let me go into the context first. Okay. Uh, we call South Africa's colonialism as a colonialism of a special type. Our enemy lived with us. They were pariahs in the world. And by the time apartheid was dismantled, or by the time apartheid was uh, down on its knees, there wasn't a country that was going to receive our oppressor. Our enemy was with us and was going to stay with us and was as South African as we claim to be. And that brought about certain pressures, but also, and I'd like to believe, brought about the outcome that we do have. Because it allowed us, and that's where Mandela's leadership comes in, is first of all to realize the objective realities that faced us. Amidst huge expectations, amidst huge anger, he was able to temper those expectations, and that's where the leadership came. When the currency of our enemy was based on fear, simple things like the aspirations, our aspirations were only to sleep with white women or to rape them, those were, it was as crude as that, or that they were not human. Uh, and on our side, a white man was an enemy, that was it. And that was the currency that was rallied around for centuries or for years, decades. The responsibility of going back to your own constituency and undoing the, your own propaganda was, I think, the more difficult task. Mm. And I think Rolf will concede that we had, as the ANC, we were a lot more successful in transmitting and conveying the message out to our own constituency. We were able to bring them along because I think uh, Ambassador would be able to tell you that the first thing that did happen when we were unbanned is that we established very, very strong uh, dynamic structures, starting from branch level and so forth. So the, the, the greater challenge, I thought, mm -hmm. was going back to our own constituencies and undoing the very currency that we were operating on for many decades. But I think what was also very unique, and, and perhaps that doesn't directly answer your question, is next to me is Rolf Mayer, who perhaps would have been the president of South Africa. He was groomed to be. I don't know why he may have had friends <laughs> in high places. But the point is that it's, South Africa is unique in this sense, that you had an oppressor who was pragmatic and realized that for South Africa to survive and for, their, for us to have a South Africa, they needed to be pragmatic. And I've very rarely seen someone or a, a power, and at that time I think you, you were the minister of what, perhaps the fifth or sixth best army in the world, mm. uh, who voluntarily, well voluntarily in inverted commas, abdicated that power, mm. the absolute power they had. On the other hand, and I'm glad Judge Goldstone is here, I've very rarely seen uh, a revolutionary party negotiate in the Constitution institutions that will keep itself, its power in check when it does get into power. Mm -hmm. So it's as if we didn't trust ourselves because we realized we were human as well. And we had learned this from experiences elsewhere around the world, and perhaps we were fortunate that we were the last in Africa to have uh, gained independence, so to speak. But I, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a rare uh, uh, example where both happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it, it happened from our own volition, or it happened because of circumstances and because there wasn't a victor or a vanquished. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that is the result. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, uh, the lesson I learned is that do not look at your, your opposition as a homogenous being. Strategically what we did was we were able to divide our adversaries <coughs> into hawks, 
and doves. Fortunately, the dove is sitting next to us. <laughs> but we were able to create a very strong center on both sides to the extent where, this, where you had a strong center, the extremities were then squeezed out. And uh, that showed in the election results too. Some of the more populist, we were not the only uh, anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, but some of the more populist uh, and the more aggressive, we thought they would have a greater appeal and resonance with particularly the unemployed youth in mm -hmm. South Africa. Mm -hmm. The results showed otherwise. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think strategically, if you are able to reach out, there is one lesson on the other side. Uh, there are moderate people on the other side whom you build a trust with. And uh, as that center grows, your extremities are then uh, pushed further aside and become uh, non-entities. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, <coughs> when you think about what Mohammed has just said about the ability to do several things. One was to negotiate a constitution that, that created limits but also established democracy. And the importance of a movement that had existed for decades on the liberation side, uh, ANC. As you look at that lesson, Ambassador, and you had now you have wonderful insights and experience, particularly through the Middle East. How important is it that there be strong institutions in those, in any country, that go to shading itself not only out of conflict, but into hopefully democracy? How important is, is it that those institutions be there in order to make this kind of a transition? Mm. No, thank you very much, um, Ambassador, both for the question and for um, just doing this job for us and getting us to think more self-consciously about what it is that we've done, because a lot of the things happened not according to a pre-plan or a template, mm -hmm. but happened <coughs> on the spur. It was simply good people who were in a Gordian, not tied to each other, didn't have anyone outside to blame, and who then had to come up with the solutions to the problems. I often think that there are societies, without naming any, who have a problem for every solution. <laughs> I think we were forced to find solutions for every problem because we depended on each other so much. But the idea of institutions, I think what sticks in my mind is this idea that you don't destroy what you want to inherit. And we understood, for example, using Judge Goldstone's presence here, that the odds were stacked us against us in a legal judicial system. It often was so capricious that it depended entirely on which judge you had, whether you'd get the death penalty, a life sentence, or be acquitted. It wasn't the institution itself. Mm -hmm. It was the capriciousness of the personnel in the institution that was often the thing. And and so, in a sense, we understood that we want to have a world-class legal judicial institution and therefore you don't spit into the well from which you want to drink. The same with the economy, the same with the infrastructure and all of those kind of things. We loved South Africa as much as what I think our opponents loved South Africa and that was the glue that held us together and withheld us mm -hmm. from absolute destruction. And therefore, I think that in inheriting the institutions, I think we went about its transformation rather than its rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, has given us the kind of purchase on a constitution that could do the kind of things that our constitution does today. I remember Nelson Mandela responding to, to Mohammed's point, saying that the task is to keep the rights of people out of reach of temporary majorities. Because he understood that every majority 
is temporary. Maybe a 50 years temporary, it may be 10 years temporary, it may be until the second coming temporary. But the fact of the matter is that the Constitution needs to be the document that guards a nation against itself at its most vulnerable moment and at its most triumphant moment. And so when you get angry, when you celebrate a hundred, or when you commemorate the 100 years of the 1913 Land Act and you suddenly want to do it, the Constitution withholds you. And so I think that those are the, 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 the kind of things that we've learned. And so the first thing is, don't destroy what you want to inherit. Mm -hmm. It gives you a respect for the country and its institutions. The second thing in negotiating to arrive at that is don't give, and since you mentioned the Middle East, um, don't give anyone a veto. The Middle East has been masters at handing over the veto to anyone. So the extremists know that if you want to destroy negotiations, lob a grenade. The extremists on the other side know if you want to destroy negotiations, announce a settlement. And the people who should occupy the middle ground should have the kind of tenacity, resilience, and commitment to see the process through, irrespective of the provocations. Because once you respond to a single provocation, you've handed the veto over. And that is where the mechanism of sufficient consensus came in. That if the ANC and the National Party agreed, it was sufficient to maintain the momentum for going forward, and we didn't even let the PAC attack on the same St. James Church derail us. We allowed the assassination of Chris Hani to be a moment of great introspection, but it turned into a moment of greater commitment because out of that we announced the election date to say to the extremists, you don't have a veto. We will now show you we will reach the 27th of April next year. And so it is about not handing over a veto. The other thing is that you must take responsibility to strengthen your adversary. There is no merit in humiliating F.W. de Klerk. It may be very tempting to call him all kinds of names, tear the skin from his face, but at the end of the day, you want him to have to be invested with sufficient authority to continue to make the right decisions, and he, in fact, needs a glue to his constituency, and that requires trust and credibility. So with you, he must have sufficient authority to push through the discussions. With his constituency, he must have sufficient trust and credibility to be able to make that decision. But if you tear down his authority, his trust, and his standing, you have destroyed your interlocutor. And I think that those are the kind of lessons that I think should be, should be learned. And then lastly, you've got to dismantle two extreme emotions, victimhood and triumphalism. Again, speaking about the Middle East, you have a competition for victimhood. Who is history's greatest victim? And I think that the sobering moment that Mohammed speaks about, about the objective reality, is when Nelson Mandela came and said, listen, we won't defeat them militarily. They're too strong. Let's find ways to do it in other, um, through other means. And that tempered the triumphalism on our side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it meant that we needed to take responsibility. And that meant, because victims can't be creative. Victims can't be forward-looking. Because their eyes are firmly in the back of their heads. They're looking at the past. And so I think when that sobering moment came, we understood the tenets of what would take us forward, including all the things, uh, the three issues that um, Rulf spoke about and that Mohammed has um, also elaborated. Very, very interesting. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, ask one more thing before I open it up. And you've been working now, uh, going to a number of other countries. What's been your experience? Can you give us some indications of where these kind of principles and understandings and, and, and conclusions that, that you've reached through your own process in South Africa have been used or relevant or picked up, whether in well, Ireland or Sri Lanka or wherever else you feel that this, you have been able to make these relevant to other situations? 
I, th I think one must immediately say no two conflicts are the same. <laughs> Each one is unique in terms of its own characteristics and, and the source of the problem, the source of the conflict, uh, every time differs. Uh, so, so it's impossible to make, as you know, direct, mm -hmm. uh, direct uh, comparisons uh, and draw similarities. But I, I think that the case, according to their own uh, uh, witnessing on more than one occasion, uh, that, that the South African example probably set themselves onto cause was Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And they said it themselves. I've heard Martin McGuinness and people from the from the unionist uh, side saying this more than once. And you two said it at the Golden Globes Award. <laughs> 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 the, uh, the, the, the fact is when, when, yeah. when we invited the Northern, Party, Northern Ireland parties the first time to South Africa, I think it was in 1997. They were not prepared to sit in the same room yet. It was separate. I will never forget it. When Madiba came to speak to them, he had to make two speeches. <laughs> because he first had to speak to the, the nationalists, the Sinn Feiners and others, and then he had to go to speak to the unionists, because the unionists were not prepared to be seen with Jerry Adams. That was 1997. And a year later, they signed the Good Friday Agreement. That was not the end of the troubles, <coughs> because it took them another 10 years to actually implement that agreement. But I think that was, that was them being in the face of our experience, seeing what we had achieved, black and white coming together. And they left the room. I can recall that. Or the, they left the the South African soil afterwards and said, if these guys could do it, then we can do it too. Mm -hmm. Other cases may be less successful, um, but it's not their fault. <laughs> um, maybe we didn't carry our message clear enough. Uh, but, but we must remember in the South African case, over and above anything else, there was the will and the intent to find a solution. The day that Madiba walked out of prison, he was focused on one thing, and that was to find a solution. He didn't demand, like Mohammed said, he didn't demand the handing over of the keys of the capital. But he was, he was focused on one thing, and that was to find a solution. And in the same way, we were focused, maybe for a different reason. <laughs> uh, you know, our process, the moment that Madiba walked out of prison, our process became irreversible. There was no return. Nobody could put him back in jail. So that will and intent to go forward and to find a solution was there. And that is not always the case, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. In many conflict areas, that will and intent remain absent forever. <laughs> um, I, I think we, we have seen some elements of success in many cases, um, not only in Northern Ireland. Uh, but, you know, then you have to go back and say the same thing over and over. Um, even in Northern Ireland, like Wendy was saying earlier, 20 visits <laughs> at different stages brought about in the end the solution. And not our making, but themselves. But it's repeating the same story. And sometimes you have to use ultimate patience. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's a lesson in itself. Also to governments who think that they can impose from outside sufficient pressure, pressure to just affect the solution. It's not working that way. Um, how, how do you see the experiences that you've had so far uh, uh, work traveling? In? I'd like to steal a line from uh, Professor Fukuyama's book on what makes uh, a nation successful. Mm -hmm. And my experience is Clearly, I'm beginning to see it in some of the Middle Eastern countries as well, that the notion of a state has not been quite strongly embedded. In South Africa itself, the strategy of uh, our adversary, I'm not going to call him an enemy anymore, uh, we're friends by the way, um, was to divide us on our tribal urges and instincts. So the loyalty towards the tribe 
there was a stronger cultural identity than a national identity. And I'd like to take credit on behalf of the ANC that there is one thing they did succeed, mm -hmm. is they were able to transcend those tribal urges. And again, the Mandela leadership factor comes in here. While he respected uh, a tribal identity, uh, he was able to invoke a larger South African identity. Uh, yes, from time to time we will get tribal urges even now within, within, uh, within, within the ANC and within the South African context. But the primary identity has been South Africa. And my own view is that sometimes, and again, external factors come in to try and solve the problem, and it's a band-aid. An election does not produce democracy. If we don't, if, if we believe democracy uh, is the result of just one or two days of, the, of, of ballot paper, it's not going to result in that. Um, it's a process. And to steal from Fuki, Fukuyama, the first is the notion of a state. Uh -huh. The second uh -huh. is strong institutions. So before an election even comes in, and, and I think, I hope Ibrahim will touch on that, the kind of measures we took before the first election came in, creating an IEC and so forth. Uh, yeah. And then the third thing is accountability. Again, I'm stealing this from Professor Fukuyama's uh, writings. And what we find, in, again, is where there's been the absence of the notion of a state, you remove a despot, and what you have is four militias operating in the country. Mm -hmm. And those militias are, are, are linked to particular tribes. We've seen it over and over. Now yeah. in the Middle East, we're beginning to see that. Yeah. We're not beginning. We've seen it for the last for several years now. So when a country is a conglomeration of tribes uh, held together by a strong person, one man, one vote, or one person, one vote is not going to give you the desired result. It's a long process. And I think from our experience, we've been going around. Sometimes we've been too much in a hurry. It's as if it's a tick box. You know what, let's have the election. We've now mm -hmm. delivered democracy and we move on. And then we have to come back in 10 years' time. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, it's a slow, patient process. Uh, and it's about building, it's about conscientizing. So that would be one experience uh, I would like to share. Mm -hmm. right. So, Ambassador, you, uh, building on this, but also your own thoughts, how do you move people, leaders, et cetera, off of either authoritarian impulses, maybe they're liberation leaders, but they're not Democrats, uh, and, and move them and move them beyond tribal or other narrower affiliations to get to the, the process of building trust and broader understandings and the, the, the constitutional principles that you said were so important uh, in, in South Africa. How do you get there? I think that I was deployed by the ANC to one of its most difficult provinces where the demographics were completely different to the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. um, where You might want to explain that, oh, West, Western Cape. In, in simple terms, the Western Cape the South Africa is a country with a majority African community where coloreds, whites, and others are a minority. But in the Western Cape, um, the colored community, which is brown, because um, I know it's a swear word here, um, <laughs> is a majority. Mm -hmm. And Africans are a minority because of job reservation acts, which, for and which forcibly kept Africans out of the Western Cape. And so at the moment of liberation, it was a province that voted the National Party back into power. <laughs> and it was confounding um, to, 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 to all of us. And I think that um, I, I then had to, to work in the Western Cape with the chief walk of the National Party um, as, as governor. And I was sat in his cabinet. And I had to work my way to get to win the Western Cape. And it was a residue of what existed prior to 1994, and it was particularly in this notion of trust mm -hmm. that I think we needed to 
um, to work because it wasn't an election campaign we were busy. It was a 10-year process to win trust, to overcome fear, and to see the tenuous nature of privilege. And that if privilege is seen as ill-gotten and obscene, it breeds its own resistance and envy. And that the politics of envy is the most dangerous politics that a nation can have because it breeds the crime, it breeds the, um, the insecurity that people have. And so there's no place for islands of prosperity in a sea of, 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 of poverty like was the case in the Western Cape. And that is why it's got the most entrenched gang culture, the most deep drug, what's his name, the pathologies of woman abuse, of child abuse, are absolutely deep. And it's part of um, a residue, it's the one province that had a genocide under colonialism. And so there's no memory of your values. It was the one province that had a legacy of slavery. You were physically removed from everything that defined you. It was the one province where dependence was actively pursued through the welfare system and there was no sense of dignity in the poverty that existed, unlike in many of the other parts of the country. And that's where they sent me. Um, <laughs> and, and basically, it was really about doing exactly what you're saying. How do you make the Constitution a document that unfolds the softness, creates a vision not simply of a non-racial society, but a gentle society? not simply of an equal society, but a caring society. And I think that that is what, by 2004, I was able to lead the ANC to its first victory um, in the Western Cape, and that's how I became um, the governor or the premier of the province. But it was about this inclusivity that Rolf speaks about, and that's why the notion, the vision that we held up was of a home for all. And really underpinning it, dealing with the racial issues, calling a spade a spade. I think that if we had moved too quickly to define ourselves after 94 as a post-racial society, we would have really just covered up the fault lines of our society. You've had to call people colored. You had to call people black. You had to call people white in order that you made them understand what was visibly defining them in order to address what was defining them. You've had to be a, because when you bury it, mm -hmm. you simply let it fester um, underground. And it manifests itself in all manners of pathology. And I think that that's the first thing, to call a spade a spade. The second thing then is to then work from the self-recognition of who we are and what we are, and to say, listen, if you are white and you have these privileges, we're not here to take it away. But the only way, you can't live behind your secure villages, your high walls, your dogs, your Dobermans, and your alarm systems. You've got to enjoy what you have. And the only way to enjoy is to share. And so the, the strategy for the Western Cape was then Ikapa Elish Lumayo, the Cape that we grow and the Cape that we share. And people bought into it because they understood that in sharing, they were building their own security. And on the other side, people understood that we do have these inequalities, but there are people who are working actively every day to overcome it. And that's the, the issue of trust. So it has a visionary component, and many people stop at sprouting a visionary component, but it also had a hard-nosed strategic component. You needed to use the instruments of government to facilitate a sharing that would go on and to show, and to use another cliche, that the patience of the poor will be rewarded with the generosity of the rich. It is when your rich appears ungenerous mm -hmm. that your poor become impatient. And when your divide is color-coded, you have the recipe of a bomb. So it's all about winning trust. And I think that that's what, in the Western Cape, we were able systematically to do. And we want so much trust that when the remainder of the National Party dissolved itself, they dissolved itself into the ANC because even some of those leaders understood that this was the kind of mutual assurance that I think that we were working towards. Uh, you know, as I listen to you, I, I could just see the 
relationships to other situations, especially calling things as they are before you move on from the fascinating. Look, I'm going to turn it over out to uh, uh, audience, but for a moment, uh, Richard, uh, do you want to add anything to uh, Richard Goldstone? Uh, do we have a microphone? Okay. No, can, no, you can, can go to the mic. One. Or you can, you can come up here if you'd like. Well, thanks very much, uh, Ambassador Lyman. It's been a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I didn't anticipate uh, 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 entering it at all. <laughs> but but let, me, let me just add three, three aspects to, to, to what our distinguished panel has mentioned. I think it should be borne in mind that in South Africa there was no religious issue. Mm. It's, it's an important negative, if you like. But I think m many of the areas of the world, unfortunately, that are uh, that that are involved in violence uh, have have religious issues, and it's impossible to compromise on religion. I think we're very lucky in South Africa that that that, that, that was that, that was absent. The second advantage we had, crucially important, is we had leaders who could deliver on what they agreed very important. I think in too many areas, le leaders are unable to get their people to, 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 to stick with them and behind them and to deliver, to deliver on what they promise. And that, that, that was important, and I think that was part of the trust uh, that, that, that uh, Rolf Mayer was talking about. Both si all, all of the leaders involved in our negotiations knew that they could deliver what they promised. I can think of nothing more frustrating than going into a negotiation process with, 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 with partners who can't deliver what they, what they agree. The third, I, th I think um, R Rolf Mayer and, and, uh, and other members of the panel have, have indicated that South Africa was able to manage its own transition. That was important. But I don't think one should underestimate or, or underemphasize the role of the international community that, that stood behind the whole process. Mm -hmm. Ambassadors like Princeton Lyman uh, had important meetings around your dinner table. Mm -hmm. I was privileged to, to, to attend some of them. But the diplomatic core, the, 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 the ambassadors of leading, leading Western nations in particular, played a very important role, especially in the early days, in bringing <coughs> enemies together Around, around their dinner tables, and that, uh, that was important. But, but, but more, perhaps more to the point, was that the, the United Nations uh, and le leading, leading countries had their spotlight on what was happening in South Africa. I know in, uh, in the work I did in investigating violence in South Africa, without the support of the Security Council, I don't believe that we would have been able to get the powers that we wanted. But then President de Klerk was aware that, that, that if any reasonable requests were, were refused, and there were some important ones, uh, there, there was a downside because of the effect that would have uh, on, the, uh, on, on, on the whole uh, 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 prospect. Uh, for 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 successful negotiations. So I think I think we're very fortunate. But I thought I'd just add the the, the, Thank you the three much. additional elements. Thanks very much. And now let's open it up. We have a gentleman here, and then we'll go here and there. We, uh, microphone for this gentleman. <coughs> there. Oh, we don't need it. Ah, it's all right. We all we all a loud <laughs> voice, but that's all right. And uh, please indicate who you are. In I will. My name is Andrew Sands. I spent 13 years in Belfast and Dublin working on the. Uh, Ooh. The mic, mic, is mic on? It's on you, but just keep it closer. Is that it? Can you hear me now? Right. Anyway, um, a, a, a concept I first ran into in Belfast was parity of esteem. It seemed to be that, it seemed to mean that you had to accept that the other, whom you may have been brought up to fear, to hate, to despise, uh, actually had a right to live. It had a right to more or less an equal application of the rule of law, and it had a right to be free of the condescension and 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 contempt that sometimes characterize behavior between communities on both sides. Um, that seemed to be, Ambassador, particularly what you were talking about or getting at. And I'm just curious in uh, what as to, uh, 
uh, caught, uh, taken by what uh, Judge Goldstone said in that it seemed to be the leadership in South Africa that was different in, 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 in the South African case from in many other cases. Because you had Mandela's, you had Rothmeyer for that matter, people who would stand up and tell the community, sorry, this behavior is no longer acceptable. I remember once in about 2000 seeing a very pleasant looking young woman standing on the side of the road as a Raid went through screaming, burn in hell, Fenian bastards, as her four-year-old was hanging onto her skirt. And that kind of thing translates down through the generations. You really have to stop it, and you have to understand why you stop it. And uh, I just uh, think that the South African experience may have been unusually blessed in the sense that you had leaders who could understand that, or did understand it, at least this really, very early on. Thank you. It is. Uh, we'll take several comments. I'll come back to the panel. Gentlemen, right, right next to you, right there. Yes, thank you. Fred Berger with Lewis Berger Group. Um, I think that you probably would agree that while the political side was necessary, it wasn't a sufficient condition to the achievements that you reached. Could you explore a bit the role that the economy, the economic structure of South Africa had? If I recall correctly at that time, it was the 10th largest and most complex economy in the world, and it had a strong middle class. As you look at some of the problems that you seek to assist in other countries, be it South Sudan or, or Burma or elsewhere, how important do you think that is in those countries achieving the peace that we'd like to see there? Third question. We'll come back to the panel on that. But I see a third right gentleman right there, and then I'll ask comment to a quote. Matar Ibrahim, former MP from Bahrain. Uh, I, I'd like to ask if you have any experience with the situation in Bahrain, if you were involved in any initiative, and uh, how do you look at the situation there from different aspects? First, the sectarian part, which is the religious part and the issue, and what is the impact? And the second issue is the kleptocracy. Um, uh, which is very uh, deep corruption environment. And the third issue is the relation with, with the US government, where US government is uh, uh, in a situation where they need to deal with uh, those regimes uh, in, in the Gulf and in Bahrain specifically. Yes, that's an interesting case indeed. Uh, oops. Uh, I, I'm going to come back to you, right? But let come in the uh, comments there, and then the uh, whole the question. This is an important question uh, on the economic. How important is it that you had a that South Africa had the particular kind of economic structure, or was that a plus or minus, or what, what's your feeling? Any any of the panelists who would like to. Well, <clears throat> there are people in the audience that know the subject much better than I am. <laughs> and <laughs> You're speaking about J.P. Landman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he has actually written a book <laughs> recently on the subject, so we should ask him to come and speak. <clears throat> but um, I, I think I would like to, 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 to put two points in perspective with right. regard to this. The first is that it might have been limited to the white community, but it was a very institutionalized economic system that existed in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it was one, like Mohammed said earlier, that was just like that taken over by the new uh, government. In the sense that the institutions that made that economy successful, or running rather, not necessarily successful, uh, were kept intact. Like, for instance, our financial system, which is still now being regarded as JP, the third, probably, um, most proven financial system in the world, according to its, its records. And I think that in itself was, was part of the, the, the historic background that came along and that was kept intact and was not thrown out, which, which I think was an important step. Some people might might say, well, you know, we haven't seen the real redistribution of wealth that is what that was required. And there's long debates about that issue in South Africa. My immediate reply to that question would be it was not the system that was the problem. But it is still not the system that is the problem. It's another way of thinking about how to bring about economic redistribution that we have to address and which is not necessarily the case even up till now. But the other point that I think is relevant is that we had during the time of, of the process of negotiations 
a, a willingness from the side of civil society as well as organized business to participate and, and assist the whole process of change. I can speak from my own experience that even long before the party leadership on the side of the National Party started to take or make any moves for change, they were encouraged to do so by the business leadership at the time. And the business leadership right through the process with some of the main contributors in terms of arguments, in terms of persuasion, to carry on and to push forward. At one stage, just to put it in context, uh, after the release of Madiba and whilst the process already started, in other words, the initial phases of talks before the constitutional negotiations happened, we, under, we experienced a long process of serious violence in the country. And none of the political leadership or political parties could really get it under control. Uh, and it was then that business leaders and civil society leaders started an activity which became known as the Peace Accord mm -hmm. that played a very important role. And it was them that actually led it that whole peace accord process. Business leader with the name of John Hall was, uh, was the chairman of the, of the peace accord structures yeah. that established peace committees in every single village and local community around the country. And that helped us to a large extent to address the problem of, of violence. So business in itself, and it's always a message that I think we try to convey to other areas of conflict is to say, Get your organized business and your civil society actively engaged. It's not only the task of politicians. You know, there was a feedback. I'm glad you mentioned the peace process, because that structure, which, which was quite well organized and had some extraordinary stories of people at local levels coming together who had been bitter enemies uh, together. But, you know, the other aspect of it was that people working at the peace process at the local level would feed back to the leadership and saying, look, we're knocking ourselves out here. What are you guys doing to settle all these issues? So it was a, it was a, a two-way process, I thought. Uh, I'd like to get others on this, but also to the, uh, the issues raised on Bahrain, not only because Bahrain is a case in itself, but because it touches on Richard's comment about religion. Is that a specially difficult area to deal with, et cetera? So it, oh, I'll, open, I'll let you deal with that question. So your name was? Matar. You're going back to Bahrain? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, we've, we've been to Bahrain on several occasions. Uh, it's very convenient to fall into the narrative that it is a religious divide. Mm -hmm. It's a narrative that has been determined by the royal family and the government. There are elements of it and uh, it's been, become very convenient for that government to polarize that society and define that conflict in, term, in religious terms. It is not necessarily so. Uh, it is, as Judge Goldstone says, it's going to become dangerous if the population then buys into that narrative and which it is doing. The Pearl uh, Square, it's now a circle, am I right? Um, it's just a road. Now. It's now just a road. Uh, <clears throat> the first uprising did not have any sec uh, sectarian uh, definition. It was an uprising because of the socio-economic conditions. Bahrain was going through a rough time. And there is, by, in all fairness to Bahrain, by Gulf standards, it is a much more open society than some of its neighbors for most of its neighbors. I suppose because it was an island and because of its cosmopolitan nature, there is, by comparison, <clears throat> a significant civil society activity there. And we were quite surprised by that. Uh, and that, I don't think, was by design. I think it just happened over the years because of, of, of how Bahrain developed as a, as a nation. 
but uh, the problems of Bahrain, and again, this is a personal view, I'm, I haven't canvassed it with, with the ambassador, and I suspect he may disagree with me, but anyway, is about a region trying to assimilate with modernity as, as well. It's about a region in which its rulers, there's a complete dissonance with an, with an increasingly educated population that's becoming agitated and it doesn't have the answers. It's comfortable with what it has. Uh, it believes its people are subjects, not citizens. And it's very difficult to engage at that level because you, they don't see their subjects as equal participants even in a, negotiated, uh, in a negotiation. Very difficult. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ancient way of looking at things. Uh, and, 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 and certainly unable to address and assimilate with what's coming through. Uh, I, I, it's unfortunate that I even see it, watch it on some of the television programs uh, and news items. This Shia Sunni divide, it's described as that. It's very convenient for the government to define it as that. Uh, it's just put people into little lagers and allowed the government to continue with the system of patronage. That's what it has done. Uh, again, then, there's also the real danger that that becomes uh, a, a fertile ground for the geopolitics of the area to start playing out. And there's that risk that does take place. About the US, would you like to answer that? <laughs> I'd, I'd like to go back to South Africa. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> well, he, yeah, I would do it. Okay, and I don't pretend to be a Middle East expert. It's Bill Taylor here. <laughs> well, but you know it, what it does raise, and no, uh, no question about it, is when a country like the U.S. has a particular relationship uh, that goes well beyond the, the issues that you're dealing with, having to do with security and, and, and military access and all the rest, which constrains uh, the way the U.S. may approach this issue and and. It's not the only situation in which countries have mixed motives or mixed issues when they get at it. But I'm not an expert on Bahrain. Sorry, can I just I, say yes. just the one thing? As we sit here, what worries us is there is no incentive on the part of the Bahraini government to introduce any reforms. No incentive. Uh, for whatever reason, because you may there's be, no pressure. There's no pressure, mm -hmm. and uh, and and therein lies the difficulty. It's business as usual, and uh, there is a, a particular modus operandi. You respect my power, and that power is respected through my violence, and that's unfortunately what what we see. You know, Ambassador Lyman, I just to agree with Mohammed. Uh, despite his anticipation that I won't. <laughs> um, but you know, not just Bahrain, but I think that we're dealing with a Middle East and a Muslim world yearning for something different. And in order to contain it, there are the old binaries. Shia Sunni, and the moment you say Shia, a whole rush of memories from 1979 come into every Western mind. And then you have predisposed it. And secondly, Islamist secularist. Mm -hmm. And the moment you invoke Islamism, a whole flood of memories come into, especially after 911. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so what it does is it wins time for the old mm -hmm. to hold on and to reorganize itself and to ingratiate themselves with Western powers on the notion, and if you've quoted Fukuyama, I'll quote Huntington, the politics of order. <laughs> and to say that what is happening in Egypt is that we are the guarantors of the politics of order. What is happening in Bahrain is that we are the guarantors of the politics of order. What is happening in Saudi Arabia is that we are the guarantors of the politics of order. And what is really filling the vacuum 
are the real fundamentalists, not Islamists, but the Salafists. Mm. If you were to trace every conflict in the Middle East at this moment, you will not find at the core of it is, the, is Islamism, is Salafism. But because it is able to invoke the Shia bogey and the Islamist bogey, it is able to win time for itself and to win a space to reorganize themselves and to make themselves and to hide the real fault lines. And the fault lines are about the politics of order because you need to hold up the threat and the whole world comes rushing um, with it. You've basically, it gives time for elites to reorganize their wealth as the oil wealth, I mean the biggest buyer, America is becoming oil independent. And as they export less, what is the future? Because no one has made provision for post-oil economies. And so you've got a systems that have, elites that have been built up in the Arab states, built on the patronage of oil, not working for oil, but on the patronage of oil wealth, suddenly you've got to understand what will be the post-oil economy, and there's no provision for it. You've got to be able to understand that there's an anachronism. You can't have monarchs, except in Britain, where it's a constitutional monarch, but you can't have real monarchs and democracy coexisting. Something at the end of the day has to give. And at this moment, through the invocation of all of those things, democracy is giving. The world is willing to bless the outcome um, in Egypt in the hope that it will mm. win two things, the semblance of democracy and the politics of order are both guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so uh, the geopolitics is then dressed up, except there's the fly in the ointment, America is talking to Iran. <laughs> so will, will things hold and will um, Saudi Arabia now become a lot more intractable? Um, and, 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 and Iran a lot more amenable. How does that turn things on its head? And I think that those are really the kind. But to, to, to end up, it comes down to the quality of leadership all over the world yeah. Yeah. that um, the first questioner um, had raised. And I think that what the world is ready for, and this really is what I've experienced in the way in which the world, but particularly here where I was at the moment of Nelson Mandela's passing, I did not find a historical yearning only for an historical admiration for Nelson Mandela, I actually found a yearning for that kind of leadership mm -hmm. where someone can speak his mind. Like Nelson Mandela said to, if you watch the movie Long Walk to Freedom, which you should all do, um, and hopefully if you have votes for the Oscars, um, <laughs> because the wolf of Wall Street looks dangerous. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, like he was able to debate it out with his comrades in prison about why he will continue with the negotiations even when they are skeptical because he understood what it means to do the right thing, not the popular thing. Mm -hmm. It is not looking at the polls and the surveys, but looking at the conditions and what the conditions need. I think the world is ready for a new generation of leaders who don't stick to the script, who respond to the situation. And I think that that is the yearning for a Nelson Mandela, and that's what we were fortunate to have, that there was no script for an F.W. de Klerk and a Ruth Mayer once they made the announcement in Parliament that they will free Mandela and unban the agency. The script was gone. Everything was going to be made up from that moment. There was no script for Nelson Mandela once he had to, and I was with him um, in the Mkonto Esizwe, the guerrilla camp in Vienna, in Angola, where he toe to toe it with the soldiers of the ANC on a hot, humid day, toe to toe it with them, telling them why negotiations is the path and why they are, as people are relevant, but as soldiers may become irrelevant. And who stands up to your army like that? I've not seen it done here, but certainly <laughs> I think that that really is the, is the kind of um, things that, 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 that leadership, and I think, <coughs> and to end up, I think that the United States economically has seen the limits of militarism. 
I think social appetite for new wars, the dial couldn't be moved ahead of the Syria, uh, even after President Obama's um, speech on Syria. He couldn't move the dial more than two percentage points. So the appetite for war is gone. And what fills the strategic gap when there's no money and no appetite for war? And that, I think, is the vacuum that the United States needs to fill as the remaining superpower. How do we do what is right? And that really is the, the key issue on the issues of leadership. Thank you very much. I want to take the gentleman right here, and then Pauline and the gentleman there. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Al Hassan Yushel. I'm um, from um, African News Analysis, the North America editor. Um, Speak up. Yes, I'm actually picking up from uh, the ambassador's point, which is um, relevant to uh, my question. Watching the live telecast of the funeral of the memorial in South Africa, I saw one of the grandsons of uh, Madiba made a statement that touched me so much. And I can only paraphrase it. He said um, something along the line of, he has charted a path. Can we walk it? it? That is really deep, very, very deep. And then, like m minutes later, came the only branch of uh, President Obama to uh, Raul Castro. Unfortunately, the world has made a political capital out of that. And looking at it, looking at the bigger picture, with four U.S. presidents attending a funeral, with a sitting U.S. president extending an olive branch to a so-called Diablo of South America, <laughs> <laughs> a tiny island that to me don't pose no threat to America whatsoever. Can America look at the general narrative of South Africa, of Madiba, and try to package it? I mean, which, of course, institute, United States Institute of Peace leading the charge, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, trying to see how US foreign policy can package the experience, the narrative of South Africa, and try to kind of softening the ground from being a Western police to a Western Pope, kind of, or a mix of both. Kind of, how to make, make, come up with a humanistic foreign policy, sort of war, war, war. Why can't, be, why can't, can't we have a positive pressure, positive pressure, like uh, that of late Madiba? That's, that's all I can say. Thank you, thank you. Uh, like, like Pauline, and then we'll take the gentleman behind her after, and then I'll go Pauline back. Pauline Baker, over. the Fund for Peace, and it's good to see old friends here again. Um, I have two questions, uh, and I'll get to it quickly. Um, regarding the role of outside powers in the transition in South Africa, the most controversial issue here was, of course, economic sanctions. Uh, it, it, uh, triggered the biggest debate in this country of a foreign policy, policy since Vietnam. Looking back, what is your estimate of the role that sanctions play in the transition in terms of content, timing, uh, et cetera? The second question is, um, I wonder if you would uh, uh, look at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the diplomatic thrust of Secretary Kerry uh, and tell us what you think, based on your own experiences in South Africa, the likelihood of a breakthrough is here, particularly with regard to two of the issues which you raised, Mohammed, and that is the concept of the state and the ability to roll back each side their own propaganda. Thank you. Thanks, and gentlemen, right behind her. Thank you. You are qualified to. I thank you. My name is Odas 
I'm a Fulbright from Fulfellow. I'm from Burundi. So, as you know, Mandela was involved in a negotiation in Burundi too, right. as well as in Congo and some other places as you said. And I liked when you said that each conflict has its particular aspects. And the issue for me is that we try to compare, I mean, some aspects from some countries and we try to yeah, to try to, to, to we try to find solutions as we did in some other places. So Mandela did one term as a president. And if you read some report, for example, from Woodrow Center and some others, you will see that Mandela did it necessarily succeed as a person or as institution not only in Burundi, even in Congo. So my question is addressed to each of you. Would you suggest to each mystic, mystical person like Mandela or any other person to get involved in these kinds of conflicts? That's my question. Uh, and gentlemen, right here, the comment. Can you get the microphone? Right. Uh, first of all, I want to give thanks to everybody. I'm uh, a bit all the clothes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Uto Kote Abich. I'm from South Sudan. I feel actually very interesting when I listen to but also I learned something that, and I feel it is very important also if I can ask a question so that I can get more of what I'm Because uh, the way they put it that they started with the trust buildings and also the issue of accountability, as an expertise, I just want to know, because currently we are in a situation that we need somebody like you who can help that community so that they can be able to come out from that situation. So as an expertise, as somebody also who achieved a greater uh, thing on this half. What do you suggest, or what do what lesson do you give to those follow, so that they can be able to achieve their independence peacefully, and also they can be able to transform their communities who are who have uh, a stereotype on their tribal issues. And furthermore, it is that in case, how do the international development head or manage the conflict or transform the conflict in that region? And thank you. Well, we have a number of, of very important issues here. Let me skip for a moment the foreign policy on the U.S. side, though I'm happy to have you comment on it. But the, the Pauline's question about outside influences, sanctions, uh, we talked a little bit about that before. How do they relate? What, what were the impact in South, in South Africa? And you mentioned Bahrain, no pressures from outside. So well, how do those outside pressures work? How did they work in South Africa? And, and what made them relevant? Yeah, Rolf was in government. I think he, were, he would be able to yeah, answer. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. Right. It implies that we reacted to the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but did it did it matter in South Africa? A because the business community, as you said, was very active and it affected them. <clears throat> Wasn't it also a psychological factor in South Africa? Because you know there are some countries or leaders who are impervious to international opinion. My impression in South Africa was among a lot of the white population, being isolated in the world was really bothersome. And of course, played out in the sports community in particular. So my, my sense was it was not just economic, it was psychological. But you're, you're better able to judge that than I am. Berlin, I would. Uh it's good to see you. 
I, I would give sanctions 25% uh, uh, as, as the influence it had on, on making the change started in South Africa. I always keep on thinking there were mainly four factors that influenced the change or the start of change. The one was undoubtedly sanctions, but sanctions was only there in the last part of apartheid. It was primarily after 1986 and the introduction of the U.S. Sanctions Act, the Comprehensive Sanction, Sanctions Act, and the, the, the implications or the impact of that started to really take effect from 1988 onwards because of the withdrawal of U.S. investments, etc., etc. But if you have to put more than 25% on sanctions, it means that all the other factors that started to play a role earlier on even during the time of P.W. Buerta, uh, are totally ignored. Mm. And those factors were the isolation of South Africa in the broader sense, like P Princeton has just said, sport, uh, politically, and in many other ways. The INC had more representation in more countries than the South African government had officially, as, a, as an example, as part of that as isolation. The third one was, of course, the, the success, ongoing and more and more success that the ANC achieved through the UDF and others inside the country by making the country ungovernable. I mean, <laughs> you might recall that I was Deputy Minister of Police at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> I had to deal with these problems that these buggers <laughs> created. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, it started to work. This policy of the ANC of making the country ungovernable. So that was a <coughs> factor. But, but the fourth one was equally important in the, in the total package. And that was the realization amongst many on the national party government side that what we were doing was totally unjustifiable and unacceptable. Not all. <laughs> Not all within the National Party, but at least there, there was a growing momentum within the party that said, we have to change. And that made it possible that when FW took over as leader, he could work on that aspect and, and, and realize that he has, by then, he had the majority of the support of the National Party to make the moves. So that was equally important. Could I add a twist to, please, to please. the sanctions issue? Please. Because um, <coughs> because I've worked in the U.S. We've reconnected with a lot of the anti-apartheid movement, the divestment movement, and used a lot of this last time around Nelson Mandela's anxiety to actually thank people for the role that they have played. And I think that sanctions as part of an overall isolation package would have... Um, I wouldn't get into the scoring because I think Mohammed wants to score himself quite well in the UDF. Um, <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is that it was not an accident because, you know, governments work on four, five-year purviews. They work with a view to the next election, what works for the next election. Business often has to think well into the future, the sustainability of business. And the point that Roof is making is correct. Sanctions did not have to bite yet. But those who work with long-term projections about the profitability of mines, about export markets, about the negative growth of the economy, about the reputation of South Africa, it's no wonder that the politicians in the National Party were preceded by the business community who didn't have to feel a loss of money in order to understand that there will be a loss of income coming soon. So, so it is both psychological, it's also real, but it's also based on the projection of where things would be, would be heading to. And I think that that was, and psychologically, the kind of overturning of Ronald Reagan's veto and the weakening of Margaret Thatcher in Britain was an enorm, enormous psychological blow. Um, for the apartheid government because those were the two who had bought into the total strategy, who had, who had prioritized the fight against communism in Africa over the fight for human rights in South Africa. And I think that at that moment, um, so it was the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act 
but not by itself and its immediate impact, but in the symbolic defeat mm. of President Reagan's veto that I think um, was, was absolutely critical. That's, that's very interesting. Let me turn, if I can, unless you wanted to get in on this one. No, 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 no. In turn to this uh, difficult question of the Israeli-Palestine. Uh, I've just been reading uh, this book, My Promised Land, which if, if anybody hasn't read it, it's, well, it's a book to read. Um, raises some very difficult fundamental issues. Um, but I know, Ambassador, you've thought a lot about this issue and this question. I wonder if you wanted to, and others comment on that. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I think that um, I've got a probably unduly pessimistic um, outlook for what will happen. I think that there's, there's sound and fury. Um, I think that there's lots of energy, but I don't think that there's momentum. I think I've, I see this energy from Secretary Kerry, and he must be commended for, uh, mm -hmm. for trying, but he's dealing with one side of the conflict that wants to claw back, who's now beginning to realize that the zero-sum politics that Palestinians generally have been engaged in, have lost them all. That where they could have been, they've been pushed back. That facts on the ground have eked out enormous chunks of Palestinian lands that they have no longer have access to the aquifers, that the settlements coincide with the flow of the aquifers, etc., etc. Um, and that the Palestinians are fighting, or half of the Palestinians are fighting a rear guard action simply to claw back some of what Oslo had, had promised. On the other hand, I don't think that there's any incentive. Why would um, Prime Minister Netanyahu want to, want to negotiate anything? He's getting what, he's, what, he, what, what he needs. He's getting the land. He's getting um, his demilitarized zone. He's got Jerusalem. Those are no, no longer the facts have preordained what the negotiations have even said should be the final outcome. Um, discussions that should be had. So, so I, 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 I'm a lot more um, pessimistic. And just to take on, apply that and the Burundi issue, mm -hmm. I think it is true, and Rulf said it as a disclaimer right at the beginning, that every conflict um, has its own specificity. But you can have your own specificity. Something can be more religious in one place and more political in another place. Something can be black and white in South Africa and um, Irish Protestant in another area. It's all, we all have those specificities. But we shouldn't allow the idea of varying specificities detract from single principles. You still need leadership. And there is no leadership. You still need trust. And there is no trust. You still need inclusivity, and there is no inclusivity for as long as someone says that the one who is the main problem will never ever sit at the negotiating table um, in, in Israel-Palestine. Um, so, so you, you violate those. You undermine the outcome. Because Mahmoud Abbas and Netanyahu, they are each other's hostage in a sense. But Hamas is the one that needs to be spoken to, because they have the veto. When they don't like it, they fire a rocket. And then they excite the army who then does collective punishment. And they are the ones who can determine the perpetual cycle. And so how can you not speak to them? And then I think that um, you, 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 you do still need the idea of investing in your interlocutor, your adversary. No one is investing. In fact, they're rubbishing each other. Um, but that's a function of trust. In much the same way, they have competing victimhoods. Mm -hmm. you, you don't relax victimhood, you're not going to get, get a creative um, solution. So while the specificities vary, whether Burundi, whether the Middle East, I think we allow people to hide behind the specificities. No, don't speak to us about South Africa, we're different. Your leadership can't be different. Your trust building can't be different. Your inclusivity shouldn't be different. Your compromising spirit shouldn't be different, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that we must make a distinction between the appearance of the struggle, which have their specificities, and the underpinnings of a settlement, which I think South Africa has by and large. So we mustn't look at 
the specificities in South Africa and what we have tried to do this afternoon, what Ruth and Mohammed does so wonderfully, is to extract the underlying principles that can be applied from situation to situation. Mm. Well, let me then come back, and we're just uh, getting toward the end, to the question raised about U.S. policy, but I would enlarge it to any uh, external force, whether it's the U.N. Or, or Great Britain or others, on those conflicts. How do you... U.S. is actually going through a period where there's a not only, as you point out, of less faith in military action, but there's also less faith in feeling you're going to influence countries one way or another, uh, whether it's toward democracy or, or conflict resolution. So if I can ask, and you can either do it through examples or generally, how do you match the outside and the inside? And and we talked about this a little bit earlier, and and uh, you know the question is, how much can the outside influences or pressure groups do if there is not a genuine movement inside with some capacity for leadership and transition? And can outsiders help build that? Is that their role? Uh, how much does outside influence help? Uh, inspire that kind of action. So, and it, it relates to U.S. policy, but it relates to South Africa's approach to Burundi or something else. So, if I could throw that out to any one of you who wishes to comment. Go ahead. Uh, could you go ahead? You no, no, okay. Mom, All right. uh, we, uh, we, we, have, we, we designated have a, you first on this we, one. <laughs> we, we have a very good example. We have a neighbor called Zimbabwe. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Very good. I'm glad you're based. And uh, I think it's uh, Nelson Mandela that made the remark. How do you expect us to help if you are, aren't able to organize yourself? There are no democratic alternatives in the country. Yes, there may be uh, formations. We saw that in, in, in Egypt as well. Mm -hmm. But what kind of an alternative is it? And if there are no viable alternative organizations and so forth, what kind of, where does the external help go to? Who do you assist? Uh, and, and unless the people of a country themselves are able to resist, Foreign help is not going to, 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 to be of any on any end. But how would you translate that to Bahrain, Bahrain where you were speaking about before, for the U.S. role or any outside role? My own view? Mm -hmm. There is enough to work on inside. There is enough. Okay. So, but that's a critical question then. You need something inside Absolutely. to relate to. Other thoughts on this? No, I, I, I think that especially this debate around the right to protect um, and so forth, which, which really deals with this responsibility from the outside when things are going palpably, horribly wrong inside, um, do you wait for some organization to happen within the country? So, 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 so possibly we've got to understand what are the gradations of outside intervention that would be required. And so there is a gradation that needs human life to be respected. And so um, I, would, I would understand, and this is probably where South Africa had a bit of a standoff with the United States around Libya. We voted for the right to protect, but then it transmogrified itself into regime change. And that has subsequently led to the kind of phenomenon that I think has not only created a militia-based set of regimes in Libya, but has inflamed the entire region and brought old conflicts back to life, even through the proliferation of weapons. So I think that we've got to understand what are the key lessons of what is possible from the outside, and how do we play a responsibility, and then create a critical mass, a pressure within to reach the point that I think we reached. You prepare for it, prepare for it, but then by 1989, 1988, 89, 90, the critical mass is achieved. Mm -hmm. It now needs one little spark. And so what is it 
the critical mass. Don't call it regime change. Don't presuppose the situation um, and so forth, but work towards bringing, launching the boil. And then I think um, it is then to determine whether it needs mediation from outside or whether there's capability for mediation amongst um, that, is, that is critical. So I would then say the responsibility to, to, to save human life is different and discreet from creating the pressure and the conditions that brings us that moment of, 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 of personam, um, of insight, and that that brings us to the point of managing dialogue, negotiation, engagement, um, and so forth, and then reconstruction. And that for me seems to be at least four um, parts of the conveyor belt of what is possible outside. And I'm not sure. I think the, 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 the US often is the victim of its desire to multitask. <laughs> they want to do all four at the same time and may often use the word regime change while they should simply protect. And so it diminishes the credibility of protection. And, 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 I, and, I, and I really think that we've got to, to think at this moment when we could possibly be envisioning a post-militarism um, period. I think we've got to hone the, 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 our skills and our consciousness about what replaces it. And I think that, in a sense, dedicating this to Nelson Mandela's memory mm -hmm. and extracting the lessons of his methodology, I think, is, is really what, what we should be and do. And, and, and I think someone mentioned the Raul Castro, um, Barack Obama handshake has that positioned us to, 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 to bring closure to what is an anachronism in international relations. The, 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 the embargo doesn't work. Um, the Cubans may be ready. Cuban Americans are going through a generational change. Um, people are tired of it, but there's just this memory of a, of a thing and our father's memories that we must keep alive. And, um, but, 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 but these are all the things that, that's, that's waiting for us. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And I, I, I'm going to bring this close. I know we've come to our ever. I'll take two more questions. There's been a lady. Oh, I got lots of questions. There's been a lady okay, there. Okay, well, we'll go to, can we go to 4 o'clock then? Is that okay? Okay. Then the lady right back there, and then I'll say, oh, my goodness. I thought Okay. Um, thank you very much uh, to the panelists there, and I actually like the discussion and the level at which it is going. First of all, I'm, I'm Eva. I'm a Humphrey Fulbright Fellow from Liberia. Uh, my basic concern, actually listening to you, especially looking at the lessons learned from the Mandela legacy and how applicable is that to uh, um, other countries, I'm just kind of thinking again about how successful um, was Mandela to uh, encouraging indigenous blacks of Africans and embracing other Africans. I ask this question uh, on the basis that uh, when you engage a typical black South African, it's like there is that same animosity. And I had a, a personal encounter at the uh, Oliver Tambo Airport in Johannesburg where I had to talk to a black South African because of a delay in our flight. And this guy was kind of hissing and he didn't even, it was like I was not welcome, you know, the manner in which he interacted with me. I didn't feel good about it. I was like, but this guy doesn't know me, not because I'm black, but I think he's working here because he needs to respond to the needs of people. But it had to take a white South African to address the problem. So I'm thinking, how successful was Mandela in actually uh, 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 bringing together indigenous black South Africans alongside other black uh, Africans who always will flood their country? And is there something that we need to really think about seriously in terms of how we apply you know, the successes of uh, 
the Mandela legacy. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take this. We'll have to be uh, ask people to be brief as we run close to time. The gentleman right here, and then the lady behind. Hello, uh, my name is Bojan Lazarevsky. I um, uh, I'm originally from Macedonia, but I've been living for three years in South Africa. Meneer Baya Danke. I uh, I was uh, working as an urban planner there, or a town regional planner, as you say. And I just wanted to add uh, one thing to the whole discussion. There is a, uh, according to me, what I call the invisible hand that is actually uh, contributing to social peace in South Africa. And it is the, and it's also a legacy from Mandela's policy. I think this is the unique developmentalist approach. Uh, of economic development in South Africa. It's moderate Thatcherism applied, um, modified to South African conditions. And I've actually seen how that transforms companies, uh, together with the PE, of course. Transforms companies, transforms how municipalities look at um, spatial uh, integris, uh, racial integration through spatial integration, social economic integration. So that's just my first, uh, uh, that's first point. The second thing is, this is a little bit a cynical question uh, to, to Mr. Mayor. Uh, do you think that uh, also the military, foreign military intervention in uh, the Bush war was also a contributing factor? This is the cynical point of view that the war pressure, there should be a military uh, threat to bring peace. Thank you so much. And the woman right, right behind him. Hello, I'm Ginny Bouvier. I'm here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, and I head up the Columbia work here. I'm delighted to have listened to your thought-provoking comments today. I have a couple of questions. I guess the first most obvious is, what are the lessons for Columbia in particular? Um, and maybe to specify a bit more, I wonder if you might reflect a bit on the peace process design. Um, that you came up with in South Africa and how elements of that might be of use. I'm thinking about the fact that you didn't choose to have a mediator. What did you do in, in its place? What did you do when the two sides came to a head and couldn't get past it? <coughs> did you have internal mediators? Did you just decide that you trusted each other and you were going to find an answer? Or did, did you have any tips on that front? I'm also thinking about the pedagogy of peace. You know, How do you make that transformation of people looking at each other as enemies move into a new realm? What kinds of things did you all come up with? Um, looking at the agenda, how did you define what would be a realistic agenda? I, mean, I could go on. We, maybe we need another session no, to look at these kinds of comparisons, but I'd appreciate your comments. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Now, there was someone back there, and the woman back there in the yellow. And then I'll take this gentleman, and then I think we'll have to. My name is Irina. I'm a graduate student um, in Peace and Conflict at American University. Uh, my question is just uh, what are your thoughts and maybe suggestions and recommendations for um, the current uh, issue in South Sudan? Um, and uh, given that it's such a tribal society, uh, the, it's very divided along tribal lines. I was just wondering if you had any comments about it. <laughs> Good, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Bram Hanakom. Um, I'm in the national leadership of the ANC Youth League in South Africa. Um, and uh, my question, I suppose, is to uh, both Rolf and uh, the speakers. One, from the ANC side, we've often, and the Youth League side, we've often thought um, that uh, Mandela's taken a lot of the credit of a movement. Uh, and quite frankly, the conditions that were there um, may well have been taken on by somebody like Walter Sisulu had Mandela not uh, survived to the stage he survived. So maybe to elaborate around the conditions that created such a personality and elevated him to national relevance in the youth, I mean, in the ANC Youth League, I mean, the ANC Youth League and the ANC, giving him the authority to, to, to negotiate on behalf of the people. And then uh, on the other side, in the government that uh, negotiated uh, releasing its power to the majority, uh, what were the conditions and influencing factors and personalities, in fact, that created uh, people mature enough to see beyond their own uh, interests? Thank you. Uh, and before I turn to the panel and let this be the last round, JP, did you, um, Professor Lanneman, did you want to make a comment at all? I'm sorry, put you on the spot. I wondered if you wanted to make a comment at all. It's, it's got a very important book yes. on South Africa. Yes, it should. <laughs> 
Well, you are putting me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, maybe I just want to make this this one comment since the the issue of the uh, of the economy was raised, and of course it's an extremely important thing. And I think the point that was made from the panel side was that the point that the ambassador made: people didn't want to split in the well from which they're going to drink. I think was a, was a, was a fundamental contributor to what happened. Rob's point about maintaining institutions, I think, equally so. And I just want to leave the audience with this one number: you can forget the rest. In the 20 years before we became a democracy, we became poorer, measured in per capita income terms, by half a percent a year. Now that's not a catastrophe, but if you add it up over 20 years, it becomes quite a substantial degree of getting poorer. In the 19 years after democracy, so far we've been, we've been raising or lifting per capita incomes by 1.5 percent a year consistently for 90 years. So from minus 10, we went to plus 33. I think that tells you all you need to know about that the transformation in South Africa, the transition in South Africa, was not just a political one, but indeed it has also so far been quite an astonishing uh, successful economic one, with lots of work to be done, especially on the inequality front. There's no question about that. And I challenge you to bring me one South African that will say that inequality and unemployment and so on are not important. Those issues, issues are vitally important, but you cannot deal with them unless you generate resources, and that we're doing. That's awesome. Thanks, Professor. Well, we have a series of questions, and I will let you uh, deal with it. Uh, the relationship of, of, of South Africa toward other African countries, black African countries, uh, the Colombia experience, uh, which I know you've, you, you have insights to, um, and um, the, uh, the, the question that you just got dealt with, too but also how important, we talked about outside influence, what about outside <coughs> threats of military intervention? I'll put all those out there and let you pick and choose and yeah, as we draw to a close, but I think there's a rich set of questions out there. May I suggest that he does the Columbia, uh, because okay. he's involved in that. I'd, I'd really like to answer the issue about uh, the word that was used. The lady has gone, is she, you know? Xenophobia. Oh, dear. Oh. You've moved. Oh, she's over there. Yeah. She's, she's there. Okay. She's, uh, she, and has then a, she has a meeting. I, uh, I, I would love to have said what you said, uh, Mr. Hanukkah, but then uh, they would say I'm campaigning for the ANC. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to see a comrade in Washington. Uh, <clears throat> no, what uh, does that say about me? <laughs> look, look, at, look at the badges got on. <laughs> no, no, the, the point is that uh, I, I didn't want to say that because it would detract from what, were, what is a great fi uh, figure, Nelson Mandela. But the truth is, he was a product of a party. He was also a product of a community. And uh, it was a very uh, interesting discussion Rolf and I had. And a minister told me, after he had been to the funeral in Kunu, that a lot of what Mandela's personality was, was reflected in that village. The people were so warm and so caring, as poor as they may have been. So he is a product of certain circumstances. So we will give credit to the party he came from, because it was a collective. But we've also got to give credit to Mandela where strength was needed. But we can't detract from the Walter Sisulus, the Governor Mbekis, and the leadership of the Oliver ANC. Tambo. Oliver Tambo. Sorry, I, 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 we, it was a collective leadership. And he maybe have been a symbol as well, but there were moments in our history where his leadership <coughs> brought about uh, changes and prevented bloodshed. Again, uh, we don't want to detract and, and, and take away from what was a great leader, but I, I agree with you that he was a product of what I'd like to believe was a great movement at the time. Do you want to address the question that the lady yeah. raised? Uh, uh, Ma'am, uh, I'm trying your to question. answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know why they shouted you at the airport. <laughs> she was thinking. 
<laughs> okay, I uh, know. Look, we do have, we do have uh, two problems. You've addressed two problems. In fact, there are three problems, or three issues that need to be uh, discussed. Uh, one is the quality of our administration. Okay. Um, Ambassador, when we, when we drafted our ready to govern, I think there was one very important aspect that we did not cover, and that was the state machinery. We looked at political transformation, but we didn't quite rely, uh, 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 emphasize the importance of the state machinery at the time. And uh, I don't want to go into this debate and, 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 and the reasons and so forth, but we've made some mistakes in that regard. And the application of some of our policies has compromised uh, uh, our administration. But there's one point I'd like to raise. Munya Langman, I'd like to hear you on this one. A bit controversial. It is disappointing that at the time, in, uh, during the time of apartheid, and I, I raise this because in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I did not see any business people who, come, who came to the TRC. People who benefited from the apartheid system. It's been disappointing for us. It was largely Africana people and people from the secure, security uh, apparatus that came up there. It would have helped. It would have made things a bit easier for us and a bit more difficult for the Malemas of this world to emerge. The second thing is, and it is disappointing, I'm being honest with you and, and, and say this, and it, it, it touches on the issue, <coughs> that we had pressures as a political party to accommodate many people who had fought against a system. We had, at some stage, had to compromise meritocracy to accommodate. It would have helped if the private sector could have put just as much energy in accommodating our aspirations as much as they did accommodate the families of those people who were fighting on the border. It did put pressure. And the perverse thing that has happened is because we, we capitulated to this pressure, the people who suffer in the end with less than desirable services are the poor, which is our constituency. So it's, it's, it's a perversity, but again, we need to take responsibility, but I just need to give you the context under which that happened. So just to answer that question, the third thing is, yes, we have had xenophobic violence, what was termed as xenophobic. We live in a very rough neighborhood. It's the truth. Very rough neighborhood. And with all our difficulties, we are in attraction to many people. We have people who would walk from Central Africa and come to South Africa in areas and live in areas where we already have high unemployment and socioeconomic conditions. So I don't think the, the, the animosity, so to speak, is a personal one. It's as a result of socioeconomic and competition. And, and I think, uh, Ibrahim, you, uh, sorry, Ambassador, you've been involved in, 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 in mediating in that regard. But there's also another, one more aspect that one of our esteemed intellectuals, Munya Anakom, I think you'd, you'd agree with this, that our mindset as well, I mean, my own development, what my opinion of beauty was, was molded in a particular way until you brought an intellectual side to it. And you would find, as we grow in confidence, this thing goes away. But what happens is, initially, after 1994, if you saw two French-speaking people in South Africa, if it was a white French-speaking person, welcome to South Africa. If it was a black French-speaking person, oh, you're an illegal immigrant. And it was our own black people who were doing it. But it's also about our own history. And it's a mindset. I think you'll, you'll have an understanding of that. It, it comes from a deep inferiority complex that we, we still have. 
and it will take years to, 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 to dissipate. Yeah, we we'll leave Ruth to pick up all the questions. Other, other, other questions. <laughs> um, but, 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 but I want to say that I was Premier in 2008 when this wave of violence broke out. And you really needed to spend time in that situation to understand the psychology of it. And it was the competition for scarce resources. It was the fact that, um, unfortunately, I think that South Africans had become a lot more stateless. They were looking to the state to provide, whereas Africans who were coming were a lot more creative in business and so forth. They were selling sugar by the teaspoon, whereas we were trying to sell five kilogram bags of sugar to very poor people, etc., etc. And I think that a lot of these kind of things happened. But the kind of Africans that also came were your very hardened warriors from the battlefields of the Congo, Somalia, and, um, and, 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 and other places. And I think um, we needed to deal with some of that. I think it, uh, I wouldn't put it at the door of Nelson Mandela as a failure. I think that we underestimated. We almost took for granted that there will be a natural solidarity amongst Africans because Africans across the continent had taken huge um, risks for us, had the infrastructure bombed by the apartheid state because they had ANC camps there and were receiving. So we, understood, we thought that the solidarity was going to be natural and seamless and that it wasn't an aspect of work. But we have a constitution that has allowed the constitutional court and others to, for example, to allow South Africans to vote counter instinctively on, say, civil unions amongst homosexuals. We transcended ourselves, even though the instinct of our people may not have been ready. And so Nelson Mandela was able to allow us to transcend ourselves in that way, but I think we were slack on underestimating the need to work for a solidarity amongst Africans and to overcome the dangers that I think we saw. I think just on, um, on, on just Bram, you know, what created Nelson Mandela, and you're just giving me a, 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 a opportunity to repeat a wonderful line that I just read last night from Bertolt Brecht's play on Galileo Galilei. And Galileo responds to someone who points out a hero, and he says, Unhappy is the land that needs a hero. <laughs> Unhappy is the land that needs a hero. And it is not that the one person does it, but that the one person we invest in to be our symbol. Nelson Mandela would be the first one to say he would not have been as disciplined in 1990 had Walter Sisulu not molded his personality from an angry person mm. in 1962. Nelson Mandela would be the first to say that he was allowed to use his charm in the negotiations had Oliver Tambo not canvassed the Harari Declaration across the length and breadth of the African continent in the camps of the ANC and amongst the cadres of the ANC to create the space for Nelson Mandela to do what he had done. That he would not have been who he was had it not been for the intellectual rigor of a Governor Becky, who taught them and had lessons with them on Robben Island. And so, he's, and so in a sense, we invested in him to be our hero because he had the personality for the time. Every era allows the personality to rise. Oliver Tambo, great hero, through the fractious years of exile, he kept us believing and kept us moving forward. And the ANC sees these things as the handing over of the baton. Leadership is a relay race, not a sprint, not an all on yourself. And I think that we all bring our personality to bear on a fundamentally similar policy. And I think that, I, I, I just look back, it was the ANC leadership in the 1950s who wrote to um, D.F. Malan, the apartheid prime minister, to say, we are ready for a national convention, we can talk. It was only the later leadership who had the opportunity to talk. So I think that, that those are absolutely critical. And that just a quick thing on this very interesting idea on the pedagogy of, of peace. Mm -hmm. I think that the pedagogy of peace starts with reinvesting strength in words which have been rendered weak. To speak peace is often seen as the domain of the weak. 
to speak compromise is to see it as being owned by those with no backbone. To speak courage, because you know the Kantian understanding of courage is not that courage is the opposite of cowardice. The opposite of cowardice is recklessness. The perfect middle is courage. And so this notion, and that's the beauty of the leadership that we had in the country at that time, that they made it a strength to be peaceful. Built an entire movement as Ruf has, has described. They made compromise a virtue, not a submission. You knew what your principles were, but you were accommodating on the pathways to your principle. It's, it's really that we redefined courage. We understood that the one who was willing to die in front of the Casper or the tank was not courageous, he was reckless. And we mustn't invest in such people the false value of courage. But we also understood who were the cowards. And that courage was the perfect middle, the, the, the appropriate bravery to not be a coward and the appropriate restraint to not be reckless. And that, I think, is absolutely critical in this fascinating concept that someone has introduced here, the pedagogy um, of peace. And it starts with reclaiming words. Of course, negotiations at the end of the day are all about words and their power. Very interesting indeed, sir. <laughs> Ralph, we'll give you the last word on, on you. everything. Um, I, will, I will try to address some of the questions that were asked, but not South Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> that was Friday's meeting. <laughs> I, um, I, I, I will first respond. I'm sorry, I can't do it in Albanian. I, I believe that might be your home language. <laughs> Macedonia. Um, your, uh, your question about the military pressure, whether that was a factor, no. What was a factor in that context was probably the fact that it would have become more and more difficult for the apartheid regime to sustain the military power, simply because of the pressure on the budget. We were running with a huge deficit on an ongoing basis for a number of years by then, and it was impossible. We had a very uh, well-equipped military force, and, but it costed money, and it was impossible to sustain it at that level. On, on the question of Colombia, um, I, I don't want to go into the details now, but I would love to exchange views, simply because I think there is a lot of similarities between Colombia and South Africa. Presently, more or less the same GDP, the same size in, in terms of population and all that. Uh, a lot we can learn from Colombia, what they've done about inequalities, etc. Et but, but of course, um, they can, I think, take examples from us about how to resolve the problems there. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, but I would like to share with you because I think it's, it's a place where we, from our experience, point of our experience, should become more involved. Uh, on the question of process, I'm a very strong believer that process is equal to content, 50-50. Uh, and and it, was, it was because we succeeded right from the beginning in, in building a process on an inclusive basis. Uh, it was not a matter of the one prescribing to the others what the rules of the game would be. It was mutual agreement on what the rules would be that helped us to overcome the early phases of, of challenges in the negotiations even. And long before we, we even sought to address the fundamentals of a new constitutional uh, dispensation, we had agreement on the process that we would follow. And we found our own mechanisms and tools along that to <coughs> enable us to overcome the challenges that inevitably had to come. So breakdowns came but we were able to, to handle them as they arrived. And that is how we succeeded in, in not depending on the outsiders to, to deal with those critical moments and challenges as they arrived. So process is a key factor and in so many situations, because there's an absence, absence of attention to process, there's no progress as far as the peace process is concerned. Um, a very 
critical question, and I wish we had more time to elaborate on this and, and, and uh, analyze it more, is the question of how do you move into a new realm, if I understand you correctly. What, what, I, what I would like to say about this, and, and in short, is that if I didn't go through a paradigm shift myself, <coughs> I would not have been able to participate and contribute in the negotiations in the way I succeeded in doing it. It's a simple fact. But it was not only me, it was a whole range of, of colleagues. And in the end, we had a critical moment where we reached a paradigm shift within the National Party thinking about the new constitutional arrangement for the country. The old paradigm was there for 340 years. It was one of superiority versus inferiority, which was the basis of racism. And we had to get rid of that. And we succeeded in getting rid of that only during the negotiations mm -hmm. through a paradigm shift, where we realized that old paradigm is totally unsustainable. Not only unsustainable, it's completely un unjust. And the moment that that shift arrived was when we started to ask the question, what is it that we want from the future, instead of what is it that we want to protect from the past? That was the moment of real change. But people, unfortunately, and it's a human behavior, mostly rely on what they want to protect from the past. That informs their thinking, and that is their paradigm where they are, because that is what they know best. And that's so difficult in most conflict situations to get people out of that pattern and think of what the future expect of them and what would be far better than whatever they might have protected from the past. So I think that is a critical factor that, that one has to look at. Uh, I think that covers... Well, it's been it's one of the most extraordinary panels I've uh, participated in. I want to thank, ask us all to thank everyone here. It's been rich and full and very instructive and I wish you all every success as you go forward but thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you.